In fact, uh, you scooped me. Uh, I mean, it, it, I'm joking. Uh, it's a great, <laughs> it's a great honor <laughs> to give this uh, lecture in honor of uh, Rita Levi Montalcini. As you just heard, I met her uh, relatively recently, and only once in my life, uh, a few years ago, uh, she invited me to give a, a seminar at her institute, and uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, particularly, uh, she was uh, very kind to invite me to her own apartment to have a, a private dinner. Um, so, yep, yeah, this is a famous picture of hers. Um, <clears throat> but I had uh, heard about her before my visit a lot. And the one of the reasons is because, of course, because of her amazing uh, scientific ac accomplishment, but also because, as you just heard, um, by some reason, not by design, but by accidents, I have had a, a very influential mentors uh, in my career, scientific career, uh, and uh, they were of scientists of Italian origin. <coughs> and <coughs> the one is, uh, of course, uh, Renato Dalbeco, uh, late 60s, uh, after finishing PhD at UC San Diego, uh, I went to Renato's lab to uh, carry out uh, postdoc research. And uh, he was an amazing mentor, and as you will see in a minute. <coughs> um, I enjoyed very much uh, the postdoc time in his lab, although it was very short. It's uh, less than uh, two years. <coughs> uh, he is the one <coughs> who sent me, <coughs> excuse me, who sent me, it, it's okay, it's okay who sent me to uh, immunology and also to Basel, Switzerland. I had no knowledge of uh, immunology, uh, but uh, he thought, this is the late 60s, um, he thought that someone like me, a young uh, scientist trained in uh, molecular biology, uh, it may be a good time to go into immunology, okay? Now, this is such a long time ago, so you probably uh, won't be able to perceive this, but at that time, there was no molecular biological uh, approach in immunology. All immunology was being carried out uh, using an uh, organism system. Uh, you know, you inject uh, some compound into a uh, rabbit and goat and uh, I guess mouse and see what, uh, what kind of reaction you get, in the immunological reactions, I mean. Or <coughs> what is called the cellular immunology. There was no attempt to understand the, the uh, basic uh, uh, molecular mechanism underlying uh, Im the immune responses. So, um, partly because uh, that I admired Renato's uh, vision, big picture vision, but the partly <coughs> real reason is because I didn't have any other choice for the next place to go because my visa, US visa was expiring in a few months. And uh, so I chose to go to uh, uh, Basel, okay? Uh, I was not meaning to really go into uh, immunology. I, wa I wanted to stay two years outside of the United States because that was the law so that I can come back to the US. But it turned out that, as you know, and as you just heard, the, the most, uh, um, I would say, important uh, discovery made in my life uh, career was uh, in Basel. I stayed there 10 years, and then uh, I wanted to go back to the US, and fortunately, another scientist of Italian origin, Salvador Ruria, who was also the mentor of Renato Dalbeco, <coughs> uh, invited me to join MIT's uh, faculty. 
And uh, so I moved in 1980 uh, back to the United States uh, in the Center for Cancer Research. Okay. Um, so all these people, great people, uh, actually have another, another connection. And I want to show this to you. And that is what I call Montalcini Ruria ped pedigree of Nobel laureates. You see all the, the names in red? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people. They are all laureates. But as you can see here, uh, in terms of scientific research pedigree, they are related. Okay, starting with Rita and the Sarva, who stayed uh, uh, in the same lab in University of Torino, I think. And then, uh, as I said, Renato was the Sarva's postdoc, and uh, Renato's colleague was uh, Jim Watson. Okay? And uh, Renato's lab generated five Nobel laureates, which is amazing. Okay? And uh, we asked Renato, how, how he does that, and uh, he will just say he does not know. And uh, in any case, <coughs> it's a great honor uh, to be a member of, of this amazing uh, uh, club. Okay. So, so much for introduction about uh, Rita, and I want to go into the subject of my talk. So, since early uh, 1990, or maybe late 1980, I, my research interest switched gradually from the immune system to the nervous system. In particular, I was interested in understanding the mechanisms underlying memory. Now, memory comes in many different forms. Okay? The one which I was particularly intrigued is the memory for events that happens to us. It's called episodic memory, memory of episode. What you did this morning, what happened to you last night, what, what you did uh, one week ago, a year ago on your vacation, those memories are all called episodic memory, okay? And for that type of memory, uh, this structure called the hippocampus, shown in orange, uh, plays a crucial role. Uh, this was shown by many different ways, but the most uh, uh, intriguing one is the analysis of this uh, uh, patient Amnesiac, amnesiac patient, HM, whose uh, MRI scan is shown here. And uh, he had a bicycle accident when he was young and then uh, suffered from serious epileptic seizures. So when he was young, uh, early 20s, I think, uh, he was operated by this Canadian uh, neurosurgeon, uh, Scoville, and also neuro. Uh, psychologist, uh, Milner, okay? And uh, <coughs> they, uh, at that time, it was not known that the hippocampus, hippocampi, uh, important uh, for very important, very uh, crucial uh, form of memory, episodic memory. So Scoville, in order to uh, reduce the um, epileptic uh, problem, seizure problem, he removed this tissue here uh, the, uh, inc that include uh, the hippocampus from both hemispheres. And uh, quickly, uh, family uh, members realized that Henry had a serious problem in acquiring a uh, new memory that happens for, for the events that are happening to him. So that suggested this uh, area uh, medial temporal lobe, including hippocampus, uh, play the crucial role for uh, this type of very common form of memory. However, many uh, years, for many years, how 
this information is extracted from their experiences uh, is stored uh, in this area of the brain and how this is maintained and how you uh, uh, retrieve it uh, for, what it's for the phenomena called recall uh, was not known. Okay. Now, 1921, this man, German psychologist, um, Richard Zeman, published this book, Die Muneme, in, 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 in German. Okay. And uh, he, the one who introduced uh, the concept or word called engram, memory engram. Okay. So according to his idea, when uh, you experience something, then uh, information from that experience <coughs> uh, will cause some uh, physical or biophysical or biochemical changes in a particular area of the brain. Okay, the, I mean changes, cellular changes. And that kind of changes last for a certain period of time, uh, which defined the longevity of that particular memory. And the record of the memory occurs when the person, subject, experience another event which has some similarity, some common features with the original experience. And uh, that second experience will reactivate these cells which went through some changes and that lead to the phenomena of memory recall. Okay. This is called the, um, the Engram theory, Engram theory of memory. However, this man, uh, Zeman, actually on his book was completely forgotten. The part of the reason is because he extended the theory uh, not uh, to, to inheritance, okay? Phenomena of inheritance. And this was, uh, as you know, the completely wrong. This was like idea of Rysenko, okay? So scientists did not take him seriously, so he had been completely forgotten until uh, in 1980, early 80, I think, uh, this uh, person, uh, Daniel Schachter, who is currently the chairman of the Harvard uh, Psychology Department, published this book and reintroduced Zeman's idea, uh, the, what is called Engram theory of memory. Okay. So now uh, s some people know about the Zeman, Zeman's uh, old idea, but uh, many still actually do not. When I asked my students, uh, only one out of, uh, I don't know, 15 student postdocs had ever heard of uh, the name uh, Zeman. Now, on, in the parallel with this, uh, last century, this man, Donald Hebb, had this uh, great uh, foresight with respect to how information uh, is stored uh, in the brain that uh, come from experience, okay? So Donald Hebb. And uh, as you know, his idea is that uh, <clears throat> the, um, when information is stored for memory, some synapse of neurons undergo uh, some lasting changes, what is called the synaptic plasticity. So combining all, all this uh, Zeman's uh, ideas and uh, Hebb's idea, uh, I could come up with this uh, conceptual di diagram uh, about the uh, memory uh, engram uh, bearing uh, neuronal subpopulations. Okay? So, not going into the detail, the, the concept goes like this. So, you, you have a uh, a population of cells somewhere in the brain. Let's take and assume in this case hippocampus because you almost always almost knows that already. So these cells, uh, as a result of some stimulation, come from another 
population of cells, the upstream of information transfer. This goes all the way back to the sensory system and external stimuli. As a result of that,